The world is not as safe as it seems. All around you, unseen, there are beings that are constantly trying to harm you and even kill you. We come into contact with them all the time and usually don't even realize it. I'm talking, of course, about germs. It wasn't that long ago that people had no idea that germs existed. We didn't know where disease came from and we were actually doing a lot of counterproductive things. People weren't washing their hands, doctors weren't washing their hands, so people who went to the hospital would end up worse than when they arrived. The knowledge of germs, that they exist, how they operate, changed everything. We learned how to fight them, how to protect ourselves, how to avoid them. It was a revolution. And could it happen again? Could there be a new revolution of knowledge about a different threat? Tonight we're going to hear from people who say they've had experiences with a kind of spiritual germs. What they learned from it and what we can learn from them. Stay tuned. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg in Life. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. My name is Curtis Childs. I'm with the Swedenborg Foundation. Happy to have you here. If this is your first time, you really picked a doozy. Like this is really an intense one to start on. But hey, join, stick around, and, and hopefully you get something cool out of it. Anybody new or old to the program can be part of the conversation. Get your questions, your comments, and we have a live question and answer period at the end. So today we're going to be taking a look at sort of the dark side of things. So turn on a light in the house if you're in a room by yourself or something, because it's going to be spooky. Well, and hopefully informative and hopefully useful in a sense. We we had in the intro, there was this thing about germs and, and how knowing something about them was a key to everything. So perhaps if we take a look at Swedenborg's experiences, other people who have had experiences like that, if we can learn a little bit about the negative side of things, we maybe we'll come up with something really good. So if we're going to have a show today that's called How to Deal with Evil Spirits, first we got to define what is an evil spirit. So the term evil spirit, I mean, that's how it's translated. You know, Swedenborg wrote it initially in Latin, but that, that term comes up a lot in his works. However, it doesn't just come up a lot in Swedenborg's works. The, the concept of evil spirits comes up everywhere. And to back me up on that is friend of the show, Richard Smoley. Well, the concept of evil spirits is pretty much universal. Um, you see it, for example, in China, where uh, there's a great deal of... Uh, tradition and lore about ghosts, keeping ghosts, sinister ghosts away. Uh, if you look at African spirituality, you see that the world seems to be inhabited by this whole kind of jungle of spirits, both good and evil. Uh, the Kabbalah in Judaism uh, speaks about evil spirits. And in fact, in some traditions like the Kabbalah, uh, they would say that um, an evil thought or an evil deed in its way can create an evil spirit, just as a good thought or a good deed can create a good spirit. So the concept of evil spirits is found all over the world and it would be hard to find a culture in which it doesn't appear to some degree or another. So you know that saying, where there's smoke, there's fire? Meaning if, if there's a bunch of related material on something, there's something at the source of it. So if there's this concept of an evil spirit or an uh, anti-benevolent, benevolent, malevolent type force uh, in all these traditions, different continents all around the world, what's, what's at the root of that? What's driving it? Well, Swedenborg and some others would say, there are really, it's because there's really something there. And we're going to look today at Swedenborg's definition of an evil spirit. What is it? And to help explain it, we pulled out a handy diagram. Uh, the great that great teaching tool. So let's talk about a person. We can kind of agree on what a person is. Although you know, I, I say that, but there's not agreement that there's a body and a spirit. Some people think a spirit is a non-existent entity, and consciousness is an emergent property of the physical brain. We can't argue that right now. We're just looking. We're starting from the building blocks that there's a body and a spirit. Um, so, and I, at the bottom, you can see this is not a great diagram because the spirit is not actually smaller than the body or inside the body like that. It's sort of a, a parallel operating thing that, that's the same. So, that this general kind of spirit-body connection is in a lot of traditions. Uh, as we go through a transition that we call death, the body goes, but then 
The spirit is the whole person then. There's no longer uh, this outer layer of body that's being operated on by the spirit. So that's how you get a spirit. Whenever you hear in Swedenborg him talking about a spirit, that's what he's talking about. It's a person who's died and now is their body is gone, they're just in spirit. So now, what's the difference between a spirit and an evil spirit? Well, it all has to do with what's inside the spirit. So we've represented here in, in shocking artistic detail good and bad things inside. If you look at the spirit uh, there, it's got these stars which were having those representing good qualities. And I mean, the things that we all can agree are good. You know, this is would be you know, altruism, compassion, not being a jerk. That's a star. And then the scribbles are our, our faults and our flaws and our road rage and that kind of stuff, right? And so you see that if you look at the spirit, we're all a mix of that. You know, we have good things right alongside bad things, you know, and that's how it is and that's all right. Uh, an evil spirit is a spirit who's, you know, a person who's died. They've gone through this process that Swedenborg describes where all of the bad stuff has taken control. You know, you see in the body, it's represented by the bad things, the scribbles taking up the head, the torso, the, the parts that really drive and move us. And the good things are relegated to the feet. They're, they're kind of the servants. They just serve the negative purposes. And that's what you get with an evil spirit. So how does that process happen? Well, there's a couple of things that go into it, and we're going to describe them for you here. Uh, and these are just principles, this is all drawn out of Swedenborg's writings, first solidified by choice, that one of the reasons, the, the primary reason we're on this planet is to form the kind of person that we want to be. And if you are continually, and we do that by choosing things, meaning we have certain things that we go after, that we think about, that we act upon, and if you continually do that, continually, is how I said that, it's kind of funny, continually do that, to negative things, you make that a part of you. And those things, the more they run your life, the more they ascend into those positions. The next one is loss of inhibitions, which means in the spiritual world, you don't have a sense of, oh, I'm making a fool of myself. You know, you go with your urges. You can't say, oh, I'm, I sort of want to say this, I want to do this, but I'm not going to. That, that, that's sort of the body holding you back. But there you kind of say what you think. And because of that, uh, you can dive a lot more readily into these negative things. So an evil spirit is much more willing to say and do evil things because they can't sort of manage their reputation, you know? Then the next one is the dormancy of good qualities. And Swedenborg says that the good things, if somebody has overall chosen negativity or evil, that that's what drives them, that's what they act on, they've decided they don't care how what they do affects other people, they actually enjoy, can enjoy hurting people. The good things are actually through a process after death put to sleep sort of and that it's done as you see in the next it's done for humane reasons it's not like well you lost so we're going to take everything from you it's that in that world if you have good qualities and bad qualities but you're ruled by bad qualities the good qualities just kind of torment you they just make your life miserable they're not helping so actually it's done to actually make the person's life more manageable even though they've chosen this evil obviously god is not into making them miserable he's trying to let them be as happy as they can within the bounds of, of the life they've chosen so those have gone to sleep and just overall an evil spirit is like a like an evil bag like a bad mean person who has grown to love what we would call evil which would be harming others dominating others and they constantly strive to act on it so that's what it is. And because it's there in the spiritual world, they have a distinct connection with our minds and our lives. And we're going to get into that. And what I would first think is if you have these evil spirits running around, and they're pretty obviously evil, you could see they have the scribbles, but it's not how they look, but you know what I'm talking about. Why don't you get sort of like a security system? I mean, why do evil spirits get to be close to us? Why aren't they all pushed away so we never have contact with them? Why isn't there some angel or God standing when they try to come into the area and saying, can I, can I see your papers, please? All right, so this is the question. Why are evil spirits around? Why is it not just something that you, oh, there's these and they live 40 million spiritual miles away. You're never going to talk to them because they just want to do bad things. Well, it has to do with the equilibrium. And this is something Swedenborg talks about a lot. That He says, actually, not just in the spiritual world, everywhere, every part of the physical world uh, on out, 
to every part of reality is run by equilibriums. And it's by opposing forces acting on each other that create this sort of middle environment in which things thrive. And he describes it in his book, Heaven and Hell, and it can be a little wordy, so we set it to uh, some moving pictures to try to illustrate it better. So here's Swedenborg, I'm reading it, but it's his words talking about the equilibrium. For anything to happen, there needs to be an equilibrium of everything involved. If there is no equilibrium, there is no action and reaction, because the equilibrium occurs between two forces, one acting and the other reacting. The state of rest arising from equal agents and reagents is called an equilibrium. In the natural world, there is an equilibrium throughout. In general, in the atmospheres, with the lower layers reacting and resisting to the extent that the upper layers act and bear down. In the natural world, there are also states of equilibrium between warmth and cold, light and darkness, dry and wet. Their median blend is the balance point. There is also an equilibrium in the members of all three of the Earth's kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal. For nothing would occur in those kingdoms if it were not for the equilibrium. Everywhere, there is a kind of effort acting from one side and another reacting from the other. In the natural world, what acts and reacts is called force or energy, but in the spiritual world, what acts and reacts is called life and volition. Life there is a living force, and volition is a living energy, and the actual equilibrium is called a state of freedom. This spiritual balance or freedom occurs then between the good acting from the one side and the evil reacting from the other, or the evil acting on the one side and the good reacting from the other. So, if that didn't make it clear enough, we're going to represent it to you physically in the studio live. You may have noticed this bottle popped up. So, if we can pop over to camera two, this is is a little science experiment that we actually got from a science teacher for high schoolers that illustrates this equilibrium of forces. So this is a bottle, it's filled with water, and inside it is one of these little things, it's called a pipette with a washer on the bottom. And the, it's filled partially with air and partially with water. So right now the air in it is making it buoyant, which is pulling it to the top of this bottle. However, if I press on this bottle, increasing the pressure inside it, that acts on, on this little pipette and pushes it down. And if you don't believe me, check this out. Boom, it goes down. Okay, so what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Has to do with this. Um, yeah, that's a pretty nice looking bottle right there. All right, so this is how it works. The, let's think of the air inside this pipette here as the good inside you. Swedenborg talks about we have an innermost part that, that God flows directly into, and it's, God is always trying to lift us up, right? God is trying to lift us up, bring good things to us. And the crunching pressure force, this is hell, trying to drag you down. And if, you've, if you're familiar at all with Swedenborg's concepts of heaven and hell, this is the underlying... Uh, subconscious of the human race and actually into the regular consciousness that we experience. The, the pull between heaven and hell is in our thoughts and feelings all the time. And if you just step back and think in sort of a colloquial sense about how we describe heaven and hell, it's not too, it's not too uh, unreasonable a thing to assert. We have this sort of cartoon of an angel and a devil on the shoulder because there's sort of this sense of, hey, there are negative and positive forces going at me all the time. So in this bottle, we have the same thing because Swedenborg says that everything reflects everything. Everything you see in the physical world can tell you things about the spiritual world, and the forces in the spiritual world can tell you things about God, and so on. So we have this here. Anyway, so the, the, uh, we have these two forces, and when, so the water's trying to push up, the pressure's trying to pull down, heaven's trying to pull up, hell's trying to pull down, but when they're both pulling equally, we end up in the middle, in this little place we've labeled freedom. And now this freedom is super important. You might, you know, okay, going down to hell, nobody wants to be down there. You can see why God wouldn't let us just float to the bottom. But you think, why don't we just get to go like that? I mean, why don't we take all the pressure off? Wouldn't we be happier if we just started in heaven? But it's not that simple. Uh, the way Swedenborg is, think about uh, a diver going up out of the ocean. If you go up too fast, you'll get this really horrible condition called the bends. We have to sit in this tank for days and days while the nitrogen in your blood sorts itself out. This, it, in the physical world, it's complicated. You can't just do things. The spiritual world is the same way. We're not ready for heaven as it is. Heaven is a mindset, as Swedenborg describes it. It's not, you just don't just open a gate, you get in there, and then you're happy in heaven. It's a mindset you have to develop. So actually, if we were pulled up there, we couldn't develop, and we wouldn't be happy, because we don't know how to use it yet. So once you get this equilibrium right there, 
oops, <laughs> heaven and hell working exactly the same on you, then you're in this freedom. And that both is freedom as we would think of it, uh, oh, I can choose good, I can choose evil, but it's also the mindset that allows us to function. It's, it's the substrate of consciousness, if you will. That's in this equilibrium here. So uh, that's a little bit on why it's there. Swedenborg describes it further, heaven and hell 597 through 598. The balance between heaven and hell is between what is good from heaven and what is evil from hell which means that it is a spiritual balance that in essence is a freedom. The ability to intend either good or evil and think either truth or falsity, the ability to choose one instead of the other, is the freedom I'm dealing with here. The Lord grants this freedom to every individual, and it's never taken away. This is so that we can be reformed and saved. For without freedom, there can be no reformation or salvation. The reason we cannot be reformed unless we have some freedom is that we are born into evils of every kind, evils which need to be taken away if we are to be saved. These cannot be taken away unless we see them within ourselves, admit that they are there, then refuse them and ultimately turn away from them. Only then are they taken away. This cannot happen unless we are exposed, exposed to both good and evil, since it is from good that we can see evils, though we cannot see what is good from evil. Meaning, if you're, if you're overtaken by some kind of negative state, you're, you know, you're so self-absorbed or something that you justify everything. You can't tell what's, what's good. You just see whatever you're doing as good. But if you are really in a good, humble, loving state of mind, you can clearly see, ooh, that's not how you treat someone. That's evil. So in that quote, if I were you, I might be a little triggered by it to say, hey, man, this sounds very sort of religious, archaic. You're evil. You're bad. You're going to be in trouble. God is going to get you. And and the Swedenborg's writing can, can sound like that sometimes, but the more you read it in totality, the more you see what he's talking about. He's basically addressing there, we have tendencies to negative things. And I don't think that's too much of a stretch. I, you know, I, I have to control. I have negative thoughts, negative feelings. You could, anyone can get triggered into snapping at somebody. We get road rage, that kind of stuff. People have tendencies to negative things. You watch the news, you know, any day of the week, you can see there are tendencies toward negative things. We have those, and it doesn't mean, oh, we are so horrible. It just means we have to help get those out of us, and you can't do it unless you really see them unless you uproot them. If you're gardening, if you never go under the soil, you're never going to get at the root of the thing. And so the evil side of things does two things. It lets us understand good and evil. It also can illustrate these negative tendencies within us so that we can see, oh, I do have that. And then we can fight it. And in the fighting of the evil is actually how you join to God and how you become the kind of person that can have this heavenly mindset that we're talking about. So you can float to the top of the bottle, no problem. So are we just go into this because this is why evil spirits are part of the mindset. This is why they interact with people and why they're not all chased away. It's not that God doesn't have power over them, and it's not that God is just trying to make our lives miserable. It's because even, Swedenborg says God turns everything into something useful meaning that even these people who are choosing that I only want to do destructive, selfish things, God is even having them, even if they don't realize it, serve a purpose, and that they're there to actually clear the negativity out of us. So that's why. Now, we're going to ramp this into high gear and take a look at a very specific, vivid example of these sort of evil influences showing up in people's lives. All right, so we want to begin. This section is called The Voices, and we'll look at this very interesting uh, correlation between what some people in psychology have been discovering and what Swedenborg wrote about evil spirits in his travels. So we're going to begin this whole odyssey with Dr. Wilson Van Dusen, and he was chief psychologist at Mendocino State Hospital in California when he wrote this book, The Presence of Other Worlds, uh, that we're reading from here. Uh, so this is what he said. By an extraordinary series of circumstances, a confirmation appears to have been found for one of Emanuel Swedenborg's more unusual doctrines, that man's life depends on his relationship to a hierarchy of spirits. Out of my professional role as a clinical psychologist in a state mental hospital in my own personal interest, I set out to describe as faithfully as possible mental patients' experiences of hallucinations. A discovery four years ago helped me to get a relatively rich and consistent picture of the patient's experience. 
He goes on to say, I found that Swedenborg's system, so Van Dusen became a student of Swedenborg, not only is an almost perfect fit with a patient's experiences, but even more impressively accounts for otherwise quite puzzling aspects of hallucinations. After dealing with hundreds of such patients, I discovered about four years ago that it was possible to speak to their hallucinations. To do so, I looked for patients who could distinguish between their own thoughts and the things they heard and saw in the world of hallucinations. I would question these other persons directly, so these hallucinations directly, and instruct the patient to give a word-for-word -word account of what the voices answered or what was seen. To recap that, because it's a fascinating thing that happened, he was working with people who we would call schizophrenic or psychotic. They could hear voices. Um, and he would, if somebody knew that they were hearing voices and that the voices were something different than their own thoughts, Van Dusen would say, all right, um, I want to say this to the voices. Now, what do they respond? Because the patient would hear hear what he said, the voices would respond, and the patient would say it back to Van Dusen. So he could almost have a conversation with the voices the patient were hearing. So that's interesting enough in itself. But to, to make it even more fascinating, there's actually somebody who's doing this currently right now. And I was able to get him on the phone for an interview. Because he's working currently in these environments, we're just using his first name um, to protect his identity. So we're going a little underground, I guess. Um, but this this is somebody who was actually in contact with Van Dusen later after he'd begun his work. They found each other. But So he's got a really interesting story to tell. And I first asked him about, uh, his name is Jerry, and I asked him, um, so how did he start into sort of this study of the voices of people? And he, he interacted acted with them. He was working in um, state prisons uh, and mental hospitals, intakes in the ER uh, across like 35 years, a long career of working with people who heard these kind of voices. So this is what he said about how an episode near when he began to investigate the voices that people were hearing. Uh, I remember one, one patient I was talking to where uh, the voices, he was getting better and better. So this was at the prison. And I figured, I figured okay, well, you know, I don't know what these things are, but what they're telling the patient is consistently negative and self-destructive. What I'm going to do is tell this guy to do the opposite of what they're saying and support him in doing that. So I told him, I said, Any, anytime the voices start telling you negative stuff, you come tap on my window and I'll get you in for an appointment as soon as I can. And we did that and he was getting better and better and better and the voices were getting weaker and weaker. And then one day he comes in and, and uh, he goes... Um, the voices want to talk to you, and they'd never done that before. They'd never talked to me personally. It was always through the patient where they'd say, "Yo, you know, tell him he's a jerk or, you know, he's crazy. And, you know, it was always, there was always an intermediary. They never asked to speak to me directly. So that took me back a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I went, uh, well, okay, what do they have to say? And I'll never forget these words. They came out and they said, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. And the hair just went up on my back. I mean, our way of life, plural. This wasn't the patient talking, you know, our way of life. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> where did that come from? You know, so at that point, I was realizing, hey, this is, this is getting personal. <laughs> this, this is, you know, they are aware of me, and they're aware that I'm interfering with what they're doing. So that's just a, a, a very vivid snippet of this long story of how he got involved studying the voices of these patients, and in the same sort of way that Van Dusen did, in talking to the patients and saying, okay, what are your voices saying now? And he learned all these interesting things that they did the ways that they behave that didn't really seem to square with this idea that they're just a chemical accident in the brain of the, the patients. And um, so that that's just sort of a little tiny preview of his whole long story where he found out, hey, these things are very goal-oriented, they display similar behaviors, all this stuff. And we'll get into a little of it here, but I hope to have more from him in another program. So w during this whole thing, you know, he had this example that he just said to you happened to him, and it sort of freaked him out. He started to look around for what could this be, and that was when he stumbled across Swedenborg, and I asked him about it here. I think it uh, it first happened when I I was uh, I picked up a copy of Heaven and Hell and started reading it, um, and I'm like, wow, this matches, that matches, you know, it's like, whoa, hey, this guy's come closer to what I've actually experienced with these people than anybody else I've ever read, 
they, there was one thing uh, where, where Swedenborg was talking about spirits, and he says uh, they come to us by turning toward us. They enter our whole memory so completely it seems uh, though they themselves know everything we know, including languages. And, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, it, that's exactly what I experienced. They can go into a person's memory and pull up every rotten thing they've ever done and rub it in their face until a long, uh, strong emotional state is created. And then they drain that off. So th that is sort of the specifics he starts to get into there. If we're going to say, oh, I came across Swedenborg, and this surprised me how much it matched what I was finding. What was it? I mean, where where did they match up? Where did they line up? And he gave a few interesting examples of specific behaviors of the voices that match Swedenborg's description of evil spirits. Um, and we're going to go through three in sequence here, just to kind of show you the correlation and how it goes and try to thicken the plot as much as possible. So, he mentioned it before, uh, this idea that these voices or these entities of some kind can call up things in the memory of the patient and use it against them. So he goes into it more here. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I've had patients who would tell me that the voices would dredge up stuff from their memory that they had long forgotten. And it's, it's always negative stuff. It's always stuff that's guilt-ridden, shameful. Uh, it's always negative. And they just rub it in their faces until they... Uh, generating negative emotional state. And virtually everything that the voices tell these uh, schizophrenic patients is negative. So that is a system he's talking about where they, there seems to be even that the voices have some kind of memory access that the patients don't have. And the, the patients, oh, oh, I had forgotten about that. And there's this, and it's not like, oh, sometimes the voices are friendly and sometimes they're not. They're always negative and they're always going at it. And Swedenborg describes this memory thing in a lot of places, including in Secrets of Heaven 751. Evil spirits stir up our falsities and evil as mentioned. From our memory, they stir up everything we have ever considered or committed since childhood. Evil spirits are able to do this with such consummate skill and malice that words cannot describe it. And you'd often get... Can you think about being Swedenborg and you're having these experiences and no one around you's had something like that? You've never read anything like that, and to just try to say, "This is really intense. What's happening here?" and and I can't put words to it. You know, I can just sense that the the energy of that trying to trying to communicate something that was so important and so um, had such an effect on the world and on people. So that's Swedenborg describing evil spirits. That's Jerry describing that. Let's get on to the next one. He had mentioned earlier in a comment uh, this energy drain thing. So I, I asked him a little more about what energy drain was. If you talk to these patients, they will tell you, yes, I feel drained of energy, and I can feel the energy being drained and leaving. Um, so apparently what these things do is they create a negative emotional state. And from some of the readings I've done is they can't produce this negative emotion themselves and it's what they feed off of. Once that negative emotional state is generated, then they, they will drain that energy off. And it, the patients will <clears throat> uh, say, yeah, I can, I can feel it leaving. And consistently, what's very strange is when you go to bring that up, that these voices are energy parasites and that they put negative thoughts in your head that generate negative emotional uh, states and then they drain off that energy. When you go to tell the patient that, the voices get astronomically louder, so they can't even hear you talking. And if you don't know how to shut them up, then you can't get that information through. So you could say the voices are just biochemical process, but it's very interesting that this process would try to block information about it that it would somehow know you're telling... And this is not just Jerry came across this once. He's had hundreds of experiences with patients like this. So this energy drain thing, uh, and especially... And the, the voices seem to even try to cover that fact up. And Swedenborg, in his Journal of Spiritual Experiences, in number 4587, he says, When evil spirits are applied, then they induce agony of the spirit by means of tedium, which they increase and inspire continually. And thus they add impatience, which begets the greatest suffering and induces such weakness on the body that the man can scarcely raise himself from bed. 
This was shown me by this means. When they were present, such a weakness took possession of me, and when they were, were removed, it ceased, in proportion as they were removed. They also employ many arts so as to infuse weariness and thence weakness. He's almost describing it like, oh, I was doing this experiment, or I was being shown this, like, here you go, this is Swedenborg, this is what it feels like, so you can catalog this and write it down. So there you have a couple of specific behaviors that are appearing in both these uh, men's experience. So let's take a look at one more, and this is what uh, I would call the cookie cutter phenomenon. It's very strange because across physical distances, different institutions, different states, once you go to tell the patient, inform the patient that these things are energy vampires, the voices will do, say, three things consistently, and it's almost like you know, they're all made it from the same cookie cutter. And I don't understand why this is, but it's very strange. They will, one, first of all, when you start talking about that, they'll get very loud and try to block out what you're trying to say to the patient. Okay, there are ways to get rid of them, so you get rid of them, shut them up. It's a temporary thing on the most part that allows the patient to hear what you're saying. Right? Number one, the voices will come and say, this guy's crazy, he's full of crap, don't listen to anything he has to say, he's a complete nutcase. Right? If the patient continues to listen, which they do because they, they see that you know more about these things than they do in a lot of cases, the second thing the voices will say consistently is get the devil away from him, leave the hospital, leave the office, run out of here, get out. If the patient decides to stay, the third thing they will do is says, attack him. And they, you know, they've done that. I had a, a psychotic Apache pick up a chair and throw it at my head and just barely clip the top of my head. And you can use that against them, you know, because when you go to tell the patient before you go to tell them, you say, okay, are you hearing the voices now? And they'll say, for, you know, well, no. And you can say, in five minutes, you will be. And this is what they're going to tell you. And you run those factors by and say they'll tell you to, you know, I'm full of crap, get the devil out of here, and attack. You know, and the, the patient is a little bit horrified. Oh, no, I wouldn't attack you. And I said, well, I know you wouldn't. But they will tell you to, you know. And in five minutes, that rolls right off. So he's saying that he's come across so many of these voices in these patients' head that he can know categories of behavior and that in different patients, so different brains, and even in different institutions, the voices act so similarly that he can catalog that and tell the patients, hey, guess what? When I do this, in three minutes, the voices are going to do this. And when the voices start to react like that, that gets the patient's attention. So how did you know what the voices are about to do? And you notice there that he has this, he's found that it's so, that strangely enough, the voices will act so similarly. And that's a very weird characteristic to think of, even if you're imagining sort of an evil spirit. What, why would they all act the same? Um, and this is something we actually couldn't find in Swedenborg. Just kidding. Why would we put it up here if we couldn't? Okay, this is from Spir Spiritual Experiences 4584. All in hell, however many soever they may be, when viewed in the ordinary light of heaven, appear like each other and also speak alike, so that you would believe them to be one and the same person, when yet they are innumerable. So this is just to show you that there's some kind of phenomenon that is being described by these three different people, Wilson, Dr. Wilson Van Dusen, Jerry Swedenborg, uh, as having these same characteristics across a lot of geography and time. And so this is an extreme example of what you might call evil influence. This, the voices of these schizophrenic patients run their lives and ruin their lives. And a lot of times they'd be in the prison because the voices got them there. However, that's not j the principles applied here can apply to more than just schizophrenic patients, more than just the fringe. It's something that can be useful to know about to all of us, which kind of brings us to our next segment, which is why are we talking about this in the first place? We're talking about it just as that animation illustrates, you know, the, why would we talk about germs to find cures? Why would we talk about this? It's to hopefully arm you with information that will make your life easier and give you more success against negativity. Uh, Swedenborg 
you can see in his experiences as he cataloged them, he began to, he was always being harassed by evil spirits. I mean, you, it's just like if you went into a, a dangerous part of a big city, you got to watch out because there's people that will harass you, right? This is his experience. He was traveling around the spiritual world, so he was going to run into a lot of negative characters, but knowledge made a difference. And you can see it here. We have a couple of quotes from him, from uh, his Journal of Spiritual Experiences. Here he's describing, when I, While I was going to bed, the evil spirits overhead attacked with a plan to destroy me, deliberating to call forth against me all of hell and all evil and treacherous spirits whatsoever. It also seemed as if I were being let down among them. For other eyes, they were overhead, in fantasy lifting me up into their midst, so that I was now surrounded by them. When they had clung for some time to these fantasies, perpetrating whatever they were able, while I lay in safety, fearing nothing, only reflecting on the things that they were up to, finally, upon realizing the fruitlessness of their effort, they withdrew, admitting that it was of no use. And then further... 3614, this is another sort of attack that was planned, but then spirits complained because they could no longer be present. Because I was abiding in the higher knowledge of faith, it was not permitted to entertain objections. They said that they then have nothing by which they can lead, saying also by which they can mislead. For by the objections, they, their objections, they very much mislead mankind. So when he didn't believe what they were telling him, and when he had these sort of higher principles of faith, this would be things like the divine guidance of the universe, the nature of the spiritual world and of the mind, uh, the good and evil and the the shades and differences and how people should act and be. Those kinds of things, suddenly these evil spirits didn't have a handhold. And you saw with what Jerry was talking about, the more information he could give the patients on the voices. And when I, you know, other parts of the interview where I talked to him, just knowing, hey, these voices are not me. They're not a part of me. This is something, and they're, they're not helping me. Just to look back over events of their life and see how these things have caused so much problem for you. Just knowing that, can make a huge difference. And we're going to get into that a little more in a second, but it's important to see that Swedenborg was able to gain sort of an immunity through knowledge. So we're trying to give you some knowledge here today, this beginnings of knowledge. As with every show, every episode of this show, there's a million things more that I'd like to say on each subject, but we just don't have the time. Um, So this is hopefully to get you started. Obviously, you can go through Swedenborg's books, pull up everything you can find there. Um, But the little bits of knowledge we arm ourselves with help. And so now I'm going to go into some specifics. Um, This is more from my interview with Jerry, where he talked about some practical things that he was doing with these schizophrenic patients to quiet the voices. And we're going to get, I know we've been talking a lot about uh, people that can hear voices. And you may say, I don't hear voices, so why? There's a connection, and we're going to make it clear within this section of the show. So hang on. In the meantime, be cataloging this information, because it's important. So this was, I had asked uh, Jerry, and oh, he, he said that there's a way you can actually push back against these voices by doing this. And this was part of sort of a, a system. And so I asked him, uh, so what do you do to, to get rid of the voices? Well, I can. But, you know, for the most part, it's a, a, a temporary thing. Um, if they don't turn their lives around uh, and, and start asking for spiritual help from a, a positive direction, um, you know, that that is only going to last for you know, maybe a few hours at the most. There are things they have to do, you know, to keep these things away. Now, uh, in my talks with Van Dusen, who was a Swedenborgian, um, you know, the first time these things hit and scared the devil out of me, uh, you know, I, I talked to Frank Rose and said, I need to talk to Van Dusen. Uh, and he brought up some experiments that uh, one guy was doing in the 1920s with static electricity. He was He was actually shocking... Uh, schizophrenic patients with static electricity, which the voices reported was like a thunderstorm to them. It was like a firestorm. They didn't like it at all, and they would temporarily leave. You know. So I was at that time. I was working in the prison, and I was like, "Okay, well, you know, how can I duplicate something like that without getting fired?" And I was, I was running through all these uh, ideas, and finally, I came up with the idea of a big rubber band. Uh, because it, the voices are so enmeshed with the person's thought that a lot of times they can't tell the difference between their thoughts and the voices' thoughts. And the voices don't want them to think there's a difference. They want them to think that they are them. You know, so one of the first things you need to point out is that these are not you. These are different from you. 
and they will start off very softly, and, and it's always negative stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, you talk to patients that once you hear these things, you can snap that rubber band, and that uh, I've been told by several patients that it hurts the voices ten times worse than it hurts them. And that shuts them up temporarily. So that's just kind of a way he found to help people snap out of it? Was that... No, 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 okay, okay. All right, so now, he talked about static electricity shock. Now, that's not like electrocuting somebody to cure them of mental illness. So, static electricity, that's a thing you rub your feet on the floor and touch, it doesn't, you know, so he's not talking about that. However, so he found out, for some reason, you do something like this, snap yourself, it doesn't really hurt you, but there's this, these, there's this some kind of connection with the voices where they think, oh my gosh, this is, this is really bad, and it actually stops them from talking for a little while. And as you'll see, it's a sort of a theme. He found there was not only that, there was talk therapy ways. He, there was information he could give that could get these uh, the voices to stop talking for a little while. However, as you heard, you got to make a positive cho- change. You got to fill that space with positive things or else the voices will just come back and come back stronger. So this we're just taking you sort of through a little uh, list of everything I could get from our interview where he gives any kind of practical technique. So this is another one having to do with, with uh, the idea of uh, guardian angels and, and evil spirits. I mean, like Sweden Boy says, you know, they have a two guardian angels and they have two demonic entities with them. And if they ask their, specifically, if they ask Christ or their positive guardian angels to shut these things up, they will shut up for some period of time. Now, the voices absolutely hate the 23rd Psalm. Um, They also hate Amazing Grace, that song. So, you know, one thing I tell the patients is even if you have to repeat the 23rd Psalm a thousand times a day, it's like sticking them with a hot stick. They, you know, they can't stand it. Uh, they can't stand anything positive. So, can't stand anything positive. And here he's also talking about specific uh, religious texts, or, or you know, even the, the Amazing Grace is not a, a biblical, it's in the Christian tradition, but it's just another positive spiritual thing, right? And that these have an impact. And this brings me into a very interesting um, part of Swedenborg's description of how you fight evil, and I want to call it only from the word. This is a phrase that he uses. He talks about, we did a show a while ago called The Purpose of Spiritual Struggles, and he says, we go through these spiritual struggles, and in them, we fight through what he calls the word. And when he's talking about the word, he uh, is usually referring to the Bible. Uh, however, it's not a straight reference, because as he describes it, the, the Bible has all this symbolic inner meaning, and also that it, the principles in it can be found elsewhere. But So what I'm saying is there's sort of a network of truth, is a, probably the best description of it. Here in uh, Secrets of Heaven 8962, he describes uh, a little bit of that. These combats, he's talking about these spiritual struggles, are carried on by means of truths of faith which are from the Word. We must fight against evils and falsities from these. If we fight from anything else, we do not conquer, because the Lord is not in anything else. So what does that mean? I mean, we're basically, what we're trying to do is create in our minds an environment in which negative or evil spirits or influences don't have access and can't gain strength or influence. So you remember in the beginning we're talking about bacteria. Bacteria needs certain conditions or parameters in for them to be able to survive and especially to multiply and grow. So you need to have certain uh, amount of elements, temperature, light, whatever these particular, I guess, yeah, whatever these particular organisms need. So what is it that makes it that so that they can't survive? There's certain things, antibiotics or, or penicillin or something, put it in there, they all die in that ring. So what is it that we can put in our mind that makes them not be able to grow? Uh, so it's, and what Swedenborg is saying is it's this thing that's called the word. And I think about the tr- fighting from the truths of faith. And you think about them as like this connection of truths, like these points of light in your mind. These are higher things you know about life. This could be something comforting that you've experienced, you know, something you've learned from somebody that you value, something like that. The way I see it, it's these, this web of principles that reminds you that good is powerful 
and that there is we're being looked out for and that that we can we don't have to believe the negative messages and when you fight from that from this pre-established thing that you've learned then you gain uh we and let me try to explain this because this is an important concept to me we actually released a video on it called um how to stop unwanted thoughts where we use this principle this is how it works for me and this is what i find if i'm getting negative thoughts and feelings which this is we're talking about schizophrenics but as it shows up in the rest of us it's everything negative in the mind and jerry's going to say that in a minute i'm kind of stealing his thunder but when that stuff comes in if i'm getting some kind of negative message about myself of course you're no good at this or you're no good for this reason or you should be afraid of this or even uh, you you know something like this is going to happen to you then if i start to try to fight from myself meaning like try to argue uh, latch on to it and no i'm actually cool because this one person said this and that i lose I always lose. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. That everything that I try to offer to these negative thoughts and feelings, they twist. I end up feeling worse. It spirals down. But if I fight from spiritual principles, if I'm almost quoting things, you, know, you find what tradition works for you. I'm not saying everybody has to do it from the Bible. Pick something that works for you. But if you fight from that, like when they, when there's a negative attack, you have just kind of a few short spiritual principles you fight from, that has power. There, there's nothing that I've come across in spirituality that has power over negative thoughts and feelings like that. Try it and watch Yeah, watch that video I mentioned. We'll try to put a link in the description if we remember. Otherwise, it's, it's called How to Stop Unwanted Thoughts. Th that, that's the most powerful spiritual tool that I've pulled out of Swedenborg. So that is what I think he's talking about only from the word. So that's a tangent I wanted to go on um, and hopefully a tool I can arm you with there. Uh, so let's return to Jerry and his description. Talking more about, he talks more about here about how information matters. What I just told you just Great. shuts them up basically so the patient can ask for spiritual help. And one thing that happens there is that, you know, the voices will make them, you know, when they pray, they'll pray for everybody else and, and not to get rid of the voices. They have to specifically ask for the voices to be shut up. And it's amazing how hard they find that to be. And <clears throat> moving into what I do, and, and, and I'm not the one that does it. I mean, I'm just kind of like the medium for it. Uh, and, and once you start approaching, telling the patient that these things are energy vampires, um, I learned this the hard way. And you know, there are a number of times I came back from uh, the, the prison and the, and the hospitals just completely drained of energy because they were hitting me also. Uh, so this is kind of like creeping up on them. You, you give the patient as much information about them as possible without setting them off. You'll start setting them off when you start telling the patient that they are different from them, that they don't belong to them. Uh, and it appears that the voices are shocked, that somebody is aware on the outside of their existence, and it takes them a while to kind of reconstitute. Uh, so they'll sit there and they'll listen. Where's all this going? Where's all this going? And then once it starts threatening them, then they become active and they start screaming. Okay, so um, you know the, the patient listens to you know all these different facets of them. They're always negative. They're always telling you lies. They're always trying to create a negative state. You know they hate your wife. They hate your kids. They're always telling you to do negative stuff. It's consistently negative. You know, and they kind of do to these schizophrenic patients what our military does to prisoners of war. You know, they harass them constantly. Those voices are constantly harassing them. That's interesting, the, the military prisoners, that we as humans have figured out a system of how do you really break someone down, make them miserable, and get them to do what you want, you know, and that the, these negative voices are using the same principles. So, where, you know, where do we get that idea from in the first place? So, that's, that's another facet of the experience that Jerry's had, and I want to sort of end his or end the, the tool section of it with the shortest, most practical one. And it's kind of, a, it's just a variation on that. Remember that thing I was going on and on about, about only from the word, from these principles. Here's a really simple way to use it. And it's interesting because Swedenborg says that 
uh, there's sort of two primary good elements, which are love and wisdom, or good and truth. And we, we've talked about that at length in the other episodes of the show. But there's this counter, and the, the good and truth kind of have this joining together, or this marriage that he says. There's this sort of counter marriage of evil and falsity that Swedenborg calls the hellish marriage, so that everything evil seeks out what is false to go along with it. And that applies right here to how the voices act and the kinds of things that they say. So you can't trust anything they say. I mean, virtually everything they say about the patient is a lie. So that's one thing the patient can, can you know, everything they say about themselves, you know, about the patient himself is a lie. When they tell you something negative about yourself, you retort with, that's a lie. You don't hook on to it. Right? Now that's something patients can do if they can remember to do it. There you go, and hopefully you can remember to do it. Again, this is not just for schizophrenic patients. This is to your own negative voices in your head. Uh, two more things from Jerry. One, these voices are here. They're in these patients' heads. What do they want? They want negative energy, right? and they want the destruction of the person. They want, they want them, you know, it, it, it appears that they're assigned to destroy that person. Okay, and, you know, if you look at the statistics, schizophrenics kill themselves at rates uh, very much higher than the general population psychiatric patients. Um, and I think that's mostly because of the voices. And they're, you know, lots of times they're telling them, kill yourself. You know, nobody loves you. No, nobody likes you. You're, you're a waste. You kill yourself. So there's nothing like no warm and fuzzy, no limits to the voices and how they act and the kind of negativity they want to bring into people and have those people act out on the world. And I've been saying it's worth the rest of us learning about that, and here's where he ties it together. They need to realize that there is, you know, every negative thought put in their mind is put in by them, by, the, by these evil things, and not to dwell on it, you know. Um, and then... These are things that everybody can, you know, needs to live by. I mean, uh, you know, we're talking about these evil thoughts, and and and, but you know, everybody experiences them, and and schizophrenics are like the top ten percent of the normal curve. So it's much more obvious there. Where it becomes obvious with the normal person is with intrusive thoughts, where you know you're standing on top of a bridge and you hear a thought saying, "Hey, uh, what would it be like to jump?" or, you know. Um, some horrible intrusive thought comes in like, oh, why don't you murder this guy or why don't you kill, you know, it's just some horrible thing that comes in and you go, where did that come from? You know, it, it's not you. It's nothing you would ever have done. You know, it's nothing you would even want to consider. But here comes this intrusive thought and you go, whoa, that's horrible. Where, you know, where did that come from? That's them. And that's what it's like. You know, so they're attracted to negative emotion, like sharks are attracted to to, to blood, you know. And the, you know they're constantly derogatory. They instill doubt, guilt, fear, anxiety. So, you know, you may not have heard voices, but doubt, fear, guilt, anxiety. You ever had those things? What Jerry is saying, and what Swedenborg says too, is that this is is yeah, it's a spectrum. You know, a schizophrenic is an obvious example, but this negative force of hell, of evil spirits, whatever you want to call it, is operating on everyone. Swedenborg actually says that all evil is from hell and all good is from heaven, and that we're kind of, you remember that equilibrium we're in, we're receiving from both sides. So this is the nature. So the more we find out about the bad side, the more we can push it away and be able eventually to have that air, that good stuff in us, pull us upwards. So that's the info that we have. Let's talk for a minute about why it matters. It, it's important. I mean, if this, if if they're right, if Swedenborg, Van Dusen, Jerry, all those people are right, and that this is the nature of the human psyche, is that it's this balance between a good side and this really destructive evil side, then that, that affects everything. I mean, that that's the, the underlying force for why the world is like it is, for why our lives are like they are. So worth knowing about, and this is, my takeaway is this, is that life is not as bad as it seems. 
And you might think, you spent this whole show telling us that there's this whole negative force that wants to, to get at all of us and is trying to do horrible things. Why does that make life better? I think it makes life better because you know the mechanism now. Think about life. Think about your life. I don't know how your life has been, but I'm just going to generalize. Everybody deals with negative things. All the people that I've talked to, the, the more personal the conversations get, the more that they kind of let me into their inner world, the more you realize a lot of people are hurting really badly and they are under siege in various ways from things inside them, from beliefs about themselves, from uh, recurring uh, sort of memories or recurring fears, from doubts, from all kinds, from feeling worthless. There's this constant barrage and assault on people. And if it's not you, you probably know a good number of people people that have this going on with them. So there's two options there. Either it's all true and you're really as bad as they say or life is really as bad as it seems or hey man, this is all propaganda. And what Swedenborg's theory and these other guys' theories says is this is propaganda. It's just lies that are being told you to make you miserable. And that to me is very liberating because it's not true. This stuff isn't true. And that's a big difference between I'm miserable because I have a perception of reality to I'm miserable because these sort of predatory forces are trying to push me around. It's a very different feel. So I think that, and you see, you see that people you know under siege, and you can tell this is something that's working on them, it's going after them, and it helps explain the dark side of human behavior and to realize that people are being pushed into things and that we can look at people more accurately that way and look at your own thoughts. And it, to me, it gives me extra confidence to just say, all right, I don't need to worry about that. If I'm getting some kind of negative thing, it's just coming from the source of lies. Why do I need to give it the time of day and that there's a, there's a good side out there? So the more that we can understand that, know that, the better it can be. And the good news in the short run is, hey, it's not that everything is wrong and you're no good. It's just that there's some, some mean influences going after you because you are cool and they don't like it and they're trying to take your, your goodness and your happiness away from you. To me, that sounds good. I mean, that's a better explanation than just, I happen to be a not a, a substandard human being. So that's what it means to me. I want to hear what it means to you. We're going to answer the questions and comments after this quick video break. All right, man, it's time to hear. So it's a heavy show, a lot of heavy content. Uh, we're talking about spirits and evil and things in mind and all that. So do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you resonate with it? What's going on for you? So we're opening up the floor. Let's see what people on the web are saying. Okay, this is from Lee. Do we only live once in this world? Uh, well, I can't say definitively, but according to Swedenborg, yes. Now, I know that there's a, there's a very popular uh, theory of re reincarnation right now. Um, Swedenborg seems to be on the other side of that. He does say you continue to grow and evolve and change to eternity. However, he doesn't say that you return to this planet to do it. Uh, sort of like the womb, uh, that that's a development stage that forms who you are, and then you live your life here. Uh, the way he's saying it, the, the, the earth is a, this planet is a womb that we go through. We form our spirit. Remember in the beginning, there was that diagram of evil and good spirit. We're moving those stars and those scribbles around in us, becoming who we are, and then we go on to the next phase. And he does describe, he says that no matter how high in ris wisdom and love you've risen as a, you know, a person after death, you've been living there for a long time, you're still just, the stage you're in is just like an egg to the next stage, you know, that you're going to come out as a bird there or whatever. You know, you continue to grow and evolve. He just doesn't say that you come back into a physical body and do that here. So that, that's how he puts it. You don't have to agree with him. You don't have to disagree with him. You can do what you want. Okay, next one. This is from Blender on YouTube. Is it one man's good, another man's evil? Uh, so this is a good point. So we're talking a lot about evil and good. And, you know, are we going to kind of be trying to do what we think is good, but it's going to turn out to be evil? Um, the intent is what matters. When we're organizing into, are we going to be a good or evil spirit? It's not what you know, it's w what your intent is. So if you, we, you know, we sort of know what evil and good are in this sense, that you can tell, I'm going to be harming this person to my advantage. 
you know that that's not good. You know, I'm talking about things when you're not blinded to it. So are you acting on that or are you trying to think of others? And people can have things very wrong. They can think I'm doing something good when they're really not. And that's not going to be counted against them. That it's about intent. You can only work within what you know. Um, so it seems like if if you thought you're doing the right thing, it's just the motivation. Are you trying to do what's right or are you not? Do you care about how you affect other people or don't you? Are you the center of the universe or do you understand that you share it with other conscious sentient beings? That's the core of the evil good thing. Um, that There does seem to be in Swedenborg's cosmology a technical definition of each, as in that there are actions that if you had a good enough uh, filter on your camera, you could snap and look, is this evil or good? However, that's not something that we can see. Where in Swedenborg says, never make a spiritual judgment about someone, meaning don't judge their intentions. Even something that externally looks really bad, you don't know what the person is thinking and feeling, their motivations. And especially with this whole evil spirit uh, direction that we're talking about, if somebody could be pushed into doing something by an influence that, that overpowered them. So you don't know. I'd say that that's the takeaway. There is, you know, there are certain things that seem to be obviously, but you you don't know. And you so you, you don't need to judge spiritually. You can make what he calls a civil judgment, meaning, well, we got to put this person in prison. We don't know. Was it intentional murder? Or what, but we can't have them out. You got to try to make those calls or else society would collapse. But you never really know what's in somebody's heart. So great question. Let's take a look at another. This is from Giselle on YouTube. Can you comment on the difference between what Christians call demonic, non-human spirits and evil human spirits? I understand Swedenborg only believed in human evil spirits. Yeah, and, and not only that, Swedenborg only believed in human anything in the afterlife. The angels are humans, that it's all, we're, we're all part of the same system, and that angel and devil are terms for people that go in these directions. And you can kind of see some extremes, you know, you watch a show about somebody who, who's murdered a bunch of people and just seems, oh my gosh, this is a very different creature than somebody who's living like a, a nice existence where they try to be as good as possible. Um, he does talk about, and we may get another question about this, who knows, but he does talk about the devil, but that is a, a name for evil in the human heart. So this is not... Uh, an uncreated being that is evil from eternity, uh, this is, the devil's in in all of us if we let it, you know, if we let it take up residence there. So that was as he saw it. He's, he's, if everything, and not, that doesn't mean everyone in the afterlife was a person on this planet. He says that there are other, and you know, if we want to go down that rabbit hole, there's other inhabited planets with, with other sentient beings. He called those human as well. Not that they're necessarily the same biological species, but that they are part of this thing. But nobody was always an evil being, and nobody was always a good being. There's always this freedom, and God is always trying to pull everyone to be good through the freedom, but there's never been a being that doesn't have that freedom offered to them. So that, that's the way Swedenborg saw it. Again, doesn't have to be the way you see it. So that, that's that question. Let's take a look at another. This is from Ginger on YouTube. What does Swedenborg say about how to deal with people who can't see the evil in them and are self-absorbed? Yeah, um, this would probably fall under what Swedenborg would call discriminant charity. He talks, and that, I think that's an old translation. I don't know what the new translation is. But he talks about charity, not necessarily just meaning giving to a soup kitchen or something like that. It's charity is dealing kindly with the neighbor. However, that doesn't look the same with everyone. You know, an obvious example is if somebody is heav heavily addicted to drugs or alcohol, to give them what they want is not charity. In the same way, giving a kid a Christmas present is charity because it's actually going to harm them in the long run. So they're actually, to them, doing something like an intervention, which may be painful for them in the short term, that actually is loving. And Swedenborg talks about this for society as a whole, for a judge to just, if somebody's committed a crime, for a judge just to let them off, that's not charity because it's not giving that person the opportunity to see, hey, this is something I, I need to change my life. There are consequences to stuff like this, so it's not helping them to be amended, and it's not charity to the next person that they're going to hurt if they're not uh, somehow incapacitated. So that's that. And then in our own lives, the same principle applies. It doesn't, you know, universal love, unconditional love does not mean you act towards everyone the same. If somebody's crossing boundaries, hurting you, hurting other people, it's not love to just let them do it. And we see this, and nobody argues with this in parenting. You know, we, we know that if you spoil a kid, it's not good for the kid, it's not good for society. So there is 
This, this, and this is the joining of love and wisdom together that Swedenborg talks about. It's knowing what's the right thing to do and, and doing it. What's internal, what's in you, the feelings. You can have burning love for someone that you are, you know, doing something that seems harsh to. Meaning, if you do, if you are a judge that needs to put somebody, give somebody some kind of consequence for what they're doing, you could still want the person to be happy, you know, but just know, you know, what's in you can be love. How you act has got to be prudent. So that's the way Swedenborg described it. So if there's somebody in your life that's causing harm, that's overstepping boundaries and isn't aware of it, yet yeah, you can do the kinds of things people do in those situations, you know, distancing yourself, some kind of organized confrontation, you know, you don't want to just go up to them and start being crazy, but you, you may get people together or try to talk to them if it has to come to some kind of legal thing, so be it. You can do all the mechanisms we've developed in society, but with the idea that ultimately, even if it's hard to see in the moment, when you sit, when you're removed from the situation, you're thinking down the road, Ultimately, I would, I could, you know, be at peace with this person if they stop their behavior, you know, if if they act normally, and you can still wish them well, even if you can't be around them, something like that. So hopefully that makes sense, and that, that's a point that he brings up. So let's take a look at another. We better keep going. This is from Sharon on YouTube. Our ego talks to us a lot, but is this something different? We seem to have lots of voices going on. It can be confusing when trying to live away from ego and live in spirit. Yeah, it's, the mind is a confusing landscape. It's hard to pick out what's going on. That's I often envied Swedenborg because he seemed to, as he reported it, have a clear, like he could see exactly what went into making up his mind. If he got a negative thought or feeling, he could go see where did this come from? What part of hell did this come from? In his cosmology, the mind comes from heaven and hell. So he could go actually talk to the people who were attacking him and say, hey, cut that out. You know, in us, it's harder to tell. It's, there's, it seems to be endless shades of gray. Is this, you know, is this something that, that I'm making up? Is this ego? Is this good? Is this bad? Is this positive, negative? It's very hard to tell. Um, the way Swedenborg describes it, as I said before, all good is from heaven, all evil is from hell. Now, I don't know exactly how that shows up in the mind. What's good? What's evil? Very hard to sort out. Uh, you know, with specifics, it can be hard just general principles. That's something you can arm yourself with. Um, I would generally say what we now call the ego, you can call hell. Swedenborg also calls it love of self, not meaning like thinking you're okay and that you can pat yourself on the back or get like a manicure or something like that. But in that love of self being, hey, I want myself ahead of everyone. That that is the voice of the ego and that, that actually that desire to dominate and be over others, that comes out of the sphere of hell. It's not necessarily one to one, like there's some devil like writing down and putting it in your brain. Sometimes there is in the case of these these voices, it seems to be pretty one to one, but sometimes it's just kind of the general sphere and it's complex. If you think about how complex the brain is, it's got to be at least that complex. So those are a few thoughts. <laughs> Hopefully that didn't answer anything, um, but that, that's what I can think of right now. And I, I just find that I try to learn, try to learn, read read books about psychology, read books about neurology, and then read spiritual literature, people who've had experiences. The more I come across, the more it's, well, I'll sometimes, like with all these people I've mentioned, Van Dusen, Jerry, Jerry and uh, Swedenborg, uh, I've come across accounts that they give, and I'm like, that's exactly what happens for me. So that, those have been real sort of light bulb moments. So the more of those you can come across, the more you can start to try to build some kind of map of the mind. So let's take a look at another one. Pardon me, I'm going to drink some water. This is from Lasagna Pie. From what I'm hearing, there are no evil people, only evil spirits. Does that mean they are unable to take responsibility for their actions? So yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, let's see. No, we we are responsible for our actions uh, in this way. Even if the influence is coming from evil or from hell, we think it's coming from us. And so if we were thinking, hey, this is my idea, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to do it, in the doing, in the, con I mean, I would imagine in some circumstances, mental illness, or there's a lot of pressure, people, I, you know, it may be people can get in a state where they're not, they're literally not in control of their actions, you know, but generally, we're the ones who have these thoughts and feelings come in, and we decide to let them stay, you know, and that you can be an angel or an evil spirit inside, 
you know, through your life choices. You know, the more, the more unambiguous you are about, oh, I really want to pursue good or I really want to pursue evil, we can be, you know, pulling in a lot of those qualities. But, to, you know, on the other side, we are being influenced from the outside. But then again, those, those evil spirits are being influenced by spirits deeper back. And Swedenborg says it's this whole continuum that consciousness is this giant machine that we actually all participate in together. I'd love to do a show on that, the whole thing sometime, but it's a mix. And we we certainly can't just say, well, you know, devil made me do it. It wasn't my fault. We're participating, but it's not like we're the sole authors of the thing. Just like if there's some kind of scandal in a corporation, you know, it there's certain people that were more or less involved, but everybody who was complicit is potentially going to get some kind of litigation or something like that. That's that's my thought on that. Um, and if you guys have other thoughts, feel free to share them in the chat room right now. Maybe you have better ones than me, probably. Uh, so that's another one. Let's take a look at our next question. <clears throat> this is from Elisa or Alyssa on YouTube. What if someone is being good? What if someone is being good to get into heaven? Yeah, right. Like, if I'm sitting here and, okay, I found out what you have to do to get into heaven, so I'm going to do it. Uh, that's, heaven is a is not just a place you can get into. It's not like, the way, this is, of course, everything I say is on these kinds of topics. I don't have first-hand experience. I'm, I'm quoting Swedenborg, but it's not a place you can just open a gate and say, I'm there. Now, I did all that stuff, so I'm in. It's a mindset. And the mindset of, I'm doing good things to, for a reward, that's not the heavenly mindset. The heavenly mindset is to do good things because you love what is good. You love the effect. You love what it's doing for people and that it's the right thing to do. That's heaven. You can't, heaven is a state of mind. So if you're doing it, that's actually more of a hell sort of thing to think, oh, I want, you know, I want a nice house in heaven. I want a fast car in heaven. So I'm going to do all this nice stuff. That's, that's still the ego. That's still the ego. It's a mental thing. So, so that's what I'd say to that. All right, so we got a lot of questions, but we got to try to wrap this up before um, tomorrow. So we're just going to take like two more. Um, <clears throat> and the rest of you, hopefully the other people in the chat room are, are chiming in. So this is X Jones. If there wasn't evil, could mankind grasp the concept of good? It's a good question. Evil is such a pain that it doesn't seem like it'd ever be worth having around. And it's not like Swedenborg doesn't describe it as God is just like injecting evil into the system. It's much more complex than that. So we can see good. However, Swedenborg does say, without knowing evil, you don't know good. You have nothing to compare it to. He makes the, that if you have a painting of a, like a really misshapen face next to a beautiful one, that's when beauty really shines. And he actually says that the spiritual struggles we go through, the hard things we go through, are one function of them is to show us this is unhappiness. Then when you get into happiness, it really matters. I was thinking, I remember one time when I was in college and I was coming out of class and I was realizing I'm in this parking lot about to go home and and it's completely peaceful here. And I mean peaceful in the sense of there is no shelling going on, there is no bombs, there are no machine gun fire. I live in a zone of peace and I I really don't appreciate it because I've never been in a place, the country I live in has never been attacked, you know, in that way. So, somebody who has lived in war, they're going to understand peace in a way that I don't. And there's sort of this principle in, in all aspects of life. So these are great questions. I wish I could get to all of them. We are going to take one more here. really appreciate the contribution. So this one is from Blender on YouTube. What do you think would happen with if people treated their voices with love and kindness? And I think you'll get different opinions on it. Um, it seemed like... Um, the ones that have been encountered, you know, Van Dusen and Jerry, the two people we've had on this, took sort of different tracks, that Van Dusen was more into sort of befriending or trying, and Jerry, and maybe because Jerry was actually working with people in prison, so this may be that they have harsher sort of voices. Um, there, But Van Dusen, he would find some positive ones, um, but they were substantially different. They were quieter and more symbolic and and only spoke when the person allowed them to speak, other than these other voices which are charging in with negativity. Um, so I, I think you'd have to talk more to, to people who had experience with this. My sense is that there are certain voices that are only, I mean, they're just trying to manipulate. And if you start being friendly to them, they'll say, oh yeah, do this, do that. They'll actually tell the, the patients, if you do this, I'll stop talking to you. 
the patient goes and does it, something harmful to themselves or to someone else, and then the voice is like, you're so stupid. You believed I would stop. So I don't know. There may be some out there that would respond positively to that if you came at it with love. I don't know. Would evil spirits do that? I don't know. Swedenborg does talk about evil spirits being able to be lifted momentarily into play, higher sort of places, but when left to themselves, they sort of come back to what they have made central to their lives. So I don't know. It's a big world. I can't claim to know specifics on that. So this is, I ask you guys to ask questions so I can just say, I don't know. I don't know the answer. And that's why that's why we do the show. So thank you so much, everybody. If you are enjoying the show, you can do two things for us. First of all, th- give it a thumbs up. Click like on YouTube right now because that helps our YouTube know that this is a show people like. But you don't have to click like if you didn't like it. However, if you stayed this long, you probably had something that was interesting for you. And then also, if you want to support the show, you could make a donation. Swedenborg Foundation, who puts this on, is a nonprofit, and your donations are tax deductible. There's a link in the description. So today we got at some pretty heavy, dark stuff. Tomorrow we're kind of going to go to the other side of the moon, and we're going to take a look at something that brings happiness and, and joy t- and meaning to a lot of people, and that something is music. Music. 